Vince Gill used to sometimes not even book the studio. He would just say, uh, I want to come in like Monday, the January 17th. And he wouldn't show up. And he'd call in about four o'clock and he goes, I'm coming in for dinner with about eight of my friends. <laughs> just for dinner. Making just a reservation. For <laughs> just for dinner. My, my parents cooked for Alan Jackson's 40th birthday. Wow. Oh my God, that's so cool. at, at his house. And Without any further ado, we're going to bring up our guest of honor. He is the one, and I'm so excited to say this name because it's such a cool name. Okay, here is the one. He is the only John Enafante. Thank you. How's it going, John? It's going good. It's going good. Glad to be here. Awesome. I, I know we're we're all dealing with a heat wave tonight, but we're indoors. We get to hang out online. It's a pretty good night. I agree. <laughs> awesome. So we kind of wanted to start by asking about maybe what you were like growing up in high school. Were you always musical? Because I know at one point you did start a, a band with your brother, was it? Yes, my brothers and my cousins. I've been doing this my whole life. I was playing at Disneyland when I was 14 years old. Oh, gosh. Um, I've never had any job outside of the music business, to answer your question. Yes, we started very, I started very, very early. And were your parents musical as well, or where would you say you got your musical inspiration? You no, they weren't. Neither one of them were, were musicians to speak of, and but they used to play records around the house, music, twenty four seven. And I've had a talk with my two brothers about this. Where did we get all our talent from? And I think it, it's, it was such a heavy influence hearing them play music around the clock. It was just embedded in my brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you remember like some of those albums that they used to play? They played everything from Sinatra to like salsa music. Just everything, just all across the board, you know, jazz, a lot of jazz. Um, and when the Beatles started getting popular when I was young, they played some Beatles records. Of course. So what you're saying is they had good taste. <laughs> yes, they had good, very good taste. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, our next question, we wanted to, to know a little bit about your audition process for Kansas. Do you remember oh, what that was, was like? That was the most nerve wracking experience of my life. <laughs> First of all, um, I sent in a, somebody said, Steve Walsh is leaving Kansas. And this guy, this friend told me, he goes, you, you can do that. You can do that gig, man. I'm telling you, you're perfect. I said, you're crazy. I mean, it's going to be a million people auditioning for that gig. He said, you got to go for it, man. You got to go for it. I said, I don't know anybody connected with that organization. But at the time, I had a four-song demo that my brother and I had put together with some decent songs on. And we were shopping a record deal with an attorney named Jay Cooper. And I called Jay and I said, the whole thing about Steve leaving Kansas, he said, do you have any connections to the group Kansas? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, my partner, Chuck Hurwitz, in the next room is their attorney. So it's like, <laughs> ding, there's my in if I'm ever going to get one. And I said, would you give him one of my demo tapes? He said, sure, man. He passed it on. A week later, I got a call by the manager. He wanted me, he wanted to meet me up in uh, Hollywood. And we met, had a great lunch, and it went very well, but there were no conclusions drawn. And then he said, I want you to come in and do a live audition in the studio. And it's like, uh-oh. None of the guys in the band were at the live audition. It was only the manager and the world-renowned producer, Ken Scott, as in David Bowie, Super Tramp, Beatles, you know. So I walked out to the microphone. I knew my way around studios because we had a little studio at home. But I went out there, my knees were just, I couldn't stop from shaking. And my voice was real quivery. And I sang one song. And then they said, okay, come on in. That was great. Come on in. I went, yeah, okay. I blew that one. So on the car on the way home, my brother made a prophetic statement. It turns out to be prophetic now. He said, pack your bags. You got the gig. I said, what were you hearing? He said, they knew you were nervous, man. But your voice just fit perfectly with the band. I said, really? I was so terrible. He said, it doesn't matter. It you fit, packed your bags, he said. Oh. And you know, I I then went on to Atlanta to meet the band, and we we played some stuff together, and I spent about a week there, and then they said you got the gig. Oh my god! My brother was right. 
he was wow he was very right yes. what is a whirlwind <laughs> yeah so okay so, so you mentioned obviously like going into this audition process that you were nervous uh that makes sense i mean obviously it's for this humongous gig one of the biggest bands in the world yeah now as your career is going on what did you do in order to combat nerves like or was that something that like once you were in the band on the stage you felt fine or was that something that you always had to deal with i didn't i tried not to think about the enormity of it all mm -hmm. which was hard to put out of my mind because you know it's a pretty enormous situation but i was so busy learning the songs for the record and having to learn the songs because i knew we were going to Im immediately do a tour I, I i was so busy you know being the new lead singer of Kansas and filling the shoes of Steve Walsh, Steve Walsh, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I stayed very busy and that's the way I, I combated my fear and anxiety. But I'd lay down at night and I would, you know, I'd pinch myself a few times and just go, is this real? Oh you know, yeah, I mean, what sad. am I doing? If there's any band in the world that I could have joined, if you had asked me, it would have been Kansas. Wow. Gosh. <laughs> okay. Um, and I, I know uh, that I think I was wondering if that's am I frozen? Am I back? Am I back? Um, I, I know you're also a producer as well. Right. So when did you realize that producing was also your calling? Um, by default. Um, when I left Kansas, we got some calls to produce some bands and you know I was always I've always been working with my brother. And he said, hey, we've been getting calls to do some production work. And do you want to do it? I said, I'm not a producer, man. I want to make a record. I want to keep being an artist, you know. And he told me, well, just approach it. Uh, just a, a pro approach producing like, and like an artist. Just be in the band. You know, get involved with the songwriter. Get involved with the melodies that the singer's singing. Get involved with the background vocals. Get involved as you were in the band. And that was really wise advice because that uh, – that helped me to become a decent producer. You know, as opposed to just being a producer sitting back in the chair and, hey, do that, try that. You know, it's like, hey, um, I would sing the, you know, I'd sing a melody to the singer and go, oh, I like that. Because I had the ability to sing, I was able to sing melodies to singers and, oh, I like that. And I'd sing it back and it would, it would just, it just worked. Awesome. Well, speaking of being a producer, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the recording studio that you have and that you opened? Well, we don't have it anymore, but it was uh, it was pretty exciting. I mean, there were days when we had Springsteen in there, Bon Jovi, Julio Iglesias, and Faith Hill all in one day. Jeez. It was, uh, we, we built it from the ground up because we're studio bus, man. We love the studio. And we started out with about 8,000 square feet and expanded to like 28,000 square feet. We had seven studios under one roof. It was called the Sound Kitchen because in the studio, you do two things. You play music and record and eat. That's it. <laughs> right? When there's a break time, everybody eats. Okay, it's back to work three hours later. Let's eat again. So it was called the Sound Kitchen, and my parents used to cook meals for some of the top top clients. Six and seven course Italian meals. Ooh. I mean, we're talking some oh, serious, oh. serious stuff. Oh my gosh, I'm and, so um, <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I just remember, I just remember them cooking for just about everybody. Vince Gill used to sometimes not even book the studio. He would just <laughs> say, uh, I want to come in like Monday, the January 17th, and he wouldn't show up. And he'd call in about four o'clock and he goes, I'm coming in for dinner with about eight of my friends. <laughs> just for dinner. Making just a reservation. Just for dinner. <laughs> just for dinner. My, my parents cooked for Alan Jackson's 40th birthday. Wow. Oh my God, that's so cool. at, at his house. And and like we had we had a little courtyard and uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to New York City, but we've seen those hot dog stands with the umbrella. Oh yeah, sure. They say the bread on them, they're usually some bread hot dogs. We bought one of those hot dog stands. And every Friday we'd have hot dog day in the courtyard in a fountain out there and all the musicians would congregate. We'd serve them hot dogs and they would all say, what are you doing? Who are you working on? What, you know, what's, what project are you doing? And it was just so awesome. You'd see all these musicians like making interaction and, and it was, it was just great. I mean, 
very cool. <laughs> I think we were probably the most successful studio in the country for about five years. Oh my gosh. So let me ask this, because obviously, you know, like you mentioned, your parents instilled really great music and you mentioned your mom was a phenomenal cook. Now, did you get the cooking from your mom? <laughs> you know what? Unfortunately not. Okay. <laughs> but my wife has all of her recipes. Okay. And she she she's she's the cook in my house. Got it. Yeah, you, you can't do it all. You're, you're yeah. busy enough. You got enough going on. Let her cook. Understandably so. <laughs> she does. She does a great job. Wow. Yep, that's a skill I do not possess at all. The hot dog stand sounds more up my alley. Um, <laughs> so, so obviously, you've produced many, 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 many records. You've also, you've also performed on on more than what it says a hundred major label albums. Is there an album that stands out to you most, an album that you're most proud of to be part of? I would say the St. Elmo's Fire soundtrack, the movie. Ooh. Um, it was very, very successful. We got to work with David Foster. Oh, um, we had the third single on the record, but the movie started to tank. But very successful. Right? And what I, what I remember that, I'll just tell you about it real quick, is it was up for a Grammy award and I took my wife to the Grammys and as soon as they announced, you know, best movie soundtrack, I mean, I already had one foot ready to lift me up and go up on, on the stage and accept the award with David Foster and my brother Dino and, you know, best soundtrack album of the year goes to, and I'm starting to like get up in my seat, Beverly Hills cop. Oh gosh. That goofy little sound, dan, 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 dan. so. I mean, okay. it was a great record. I mean, there was sure. yes, sure. Shout out to Beverly Hills Cop. Um, <laughs> Good on you. Yeah. I just kind of went, oh my gosh. <laughs> but the movie was very extremely popular. Yes. Oh yes, oh yes, that it was. Mm -hmm. It was like the Brat Pack era of of films, right? Exactly. It yeah. kicked off a lot of their careers. Yeah, for sure. But but Beverly Hills Cop that cop that movie did better than St. Elmo's Fire, which is still mm -hmm. surprising to me. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna do? You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, we wanted to to touch base a little bit about um, your newest studio album, The Amazing Grace, mm -hmm. which was released on April twenty second. So for anybody who has uh, not got it yet, please do so. Um, Thank you. Your first studio album in nearly a decade. So we were just wondering what was the process like recording this versus some of your other stuff that you've worked on in the past? How was it different this time? Well, first of all, I never saw one musician live. We were never in the same room together. Gosh. We did it all via internet. Uh, we used a program called Audio Movers, which allows you to hear what he's hearing on his end through my studio monitors. And we can talk in real time back and forth. Like, for instance, my guitar player, I would say, hey, you know, try try a Les Paul and a Marshall. I really want a Jimmy Page kind of thing right here. Okay. <laughs> so it was almost that it was not that much different than really being in the same room. That's very because cool. I would, I would achieve yeah. the same the same thing. But, you know, the COVID thing had a lot to do with this record, too. Um, I mean, I had a million gigs canceled. You know, we were all in lockdown. Nobody knew what to think. I mean, it's like, are we all going to die? You know, it was it was scary. I mean, it was because nobody really knew what you know what was going to happen. And um, this record was sort of, I, I wouldn't say it was born out of COVID, but it was. Uh, I'm not sure if it wasn't for COVID, this record would have been made at all. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like uh, those two years it really changed a lot of people's perspectives and oh, yeah. remotivated us and made us think things differently. And so I am curious to see, you know, what would and wouldn't exist uh, if it wasn't for those crazy years, but I'm very happy that the amazing grace exists. So well, thank uh, you very much. I appreciate that. that. Of course. Of course. Um, also look at that graphic. Cause I think that is super cool. And it's also <laughs> just a little bit talk culture, which I love. I know. <laughs> I, I, I like the vibes. It reminds us of us. So. <laughs> We, we love it. Thank okay. you. Of course. And so um, obviously, you know, you've, you've won multiple awards, Grammys, yes, and you've been nominated as well. Um, but I, and, and obviously those are wonderful life accomplishments, but we wanted to know what would you say is your biggest 
personal life accomplishment? Um, gosh, I have several, but my biggest life accomplishment, um, you know what? I, I got to harken back to one thing when I, I received a letter in the mail once, um, we did a couple of records with the name under the name Mastodon, which were pretty successful, mm -hmm. especially in Europe. And Dave Amato, the guitar player in Ario Speedwagon, who took over for Gary Richrath, he's been with him 35 years now, sang a song called Life on the Line. And a lady had written me this letter. It had to be six pages long, you know, single spaced. It was, it was a lot of reading. She was, she was going to commit suicide. She was all set to just move in uh, oncoming traffic. And what she told me in the letter was that she had the song in her cassette player. I remember back then it was a cassette. She had it in her cassette player, and that song just started blasting. And she changed her mind and didn't do it. That's a big that's a big accomplishment. That's like I mean, that's the equivalent of me saying that God used me to help save somebody's life. Right. And since then I've gotten about three other letters that were very similar. My goodness. I would say I, 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 I would have, I think you both would have to agree that that's a big accomplishment. Oh, absolutely. Not anything that I did directly, but indirectly. Wow. And music saves wow. lives, you know, like, um, wow. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That, Just wow. That. <laughs> my, other, my other accomplishments were marrying a wonderful woman and adopting two wonderful children. See, those are the, the normal kinds of answers we get. Oh, yeah. 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 Usually you don't get, you know, I helped save people's lives. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's incredible. It's, just, yeah. That is. Wow. Well, this, the song that God gave me helped save someone's life. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which is, I'm proud to say it. Wow. Well, and thank you for sharing that with us. Yes. Yeah. That's, sure. that's right. Donna. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, it's nice. <laughs> um, we, we like to ask this of all touring musicians, whether they are currently doing it or have done it or just know about what it feels like. Aside from your equipment, what is one thing you always have to bring with you on the road? Um, like a, a lucky badminton racket or... <laughs> sure, of course. You, you know what? That's real easy. I can't sleep with my little small fan. Ah. I clip it on to my nightstand in the hotel. And I can't sleep without it. It's it's like a pacifier. As soon as I turn that fan on and feel that little bit of breeze blowing on me, I'm ready to sleep. See, I was going to ask if it was for the air or like the white noise. You both. Know? Like, both. Both. That's smart. That's a good one. In fact, yeah. every oh. time I pull out my stuff to you know go on the next road gig, it's I make sure I pull that out first so I don't forget it because I did forget it once. And I tried using some white noise on my phone. It wasn't the same. Not the same. No, 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 no. not the same. But plus, the phone I, can't really make the air no, happen. Yeah. No. And, and hotels are notorious for. You know, I've been in some beautiful hotels, but where they fall short is they need to put something on their door so they don't slam. Mm. Oh yes. I mean, just you know, have it shut oh, slow and just latch, but not boom. Right. <laughs> No, Especially like, like you know, it's garden hotels. Oh no, man! It's like, please, man, put some a, a you know, slow closing hinge or something. Okay, well, who do we have to call? Mr. Ritz is that his name? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Ritz Carlton. If you can exactly. help him out. Mr. Ritz. Oh yeah. man, yeah, always, always, always. Um, Jude wants to know what's something that you like to do to unwind after a night of performing. Um, I like mingling with the people. I do. I like getting opinions about what they thought of the show and just, you know, you, because usually when you're done with a show, people are all giddy. It's like, wow, that was a great show. And they want to take pictures. And, but I like, you know, I like hearing where somebody's from, what do they do? It's, it's just, I find that interesting. And sometimes when you're trying to make it through the crowd to get back to your room or to your fan, um, you hear a lot of little interesting stories from people, very, very, you know, people from all walks of life. And that's kind of what unwinds me. 
Uh, and, you know, speaking of meeting your fans and all this, and obviously you being back on the road and us getting to experience live music again, why do you think live music is so important, especially right now? Um, well, first of all, because people have been cooped up for two years. <laughs> um, I think, well, I, I can speak from, from my perspective is that Classic rock is bigger than ever. I mean, I just spoke to my friend Dave Amato the other day from REO Speedwagon. He said, John, we are killing it out here. I mean, we are playing, you know, we're playing 15,000 seaters with 7,000 people being turned away because they can't fit them in. You know, so classic rock is just humongous. And I mean, <laughs> But you know, my, my son, my son is in—he's very much into classic rock, but he's also into some. He likes some of that hip, hip um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Just—is it EDM music? Is that what it's called? Oh yeah, like dance trance, yeah. Yeah, they you know the big giant bottom end bass that just rattles the whole place, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like and he went down to see um, Kanye West in Atlanta a couple of times. And the guy had the whole like what is it, Ford Arena or whatever, in Atlanta just packed out. So people are coming out to see live music. Yeah. I don't even know if Kanye performed. I think he just played the record without even performing. Oh, the, the Donda or Donda record? Not yeah. Exactly. Donda. Yeah. Only Kanye can get away with that. I mean, like, <laughs> right? He three times. Yeah. Gosh. And I don't think he ever performed live. Oh, Kanye. He had to do that. <laughs> He's a revolutionary. <laughs> Danica? <laughs> All right. Well, because I know we got a real quick scoot to our game. So um, is there a particular song that when you know you get to play it, makes you even more excited to be playing it? Um, that's another good question. You know what song I really love singing? It's not something I wrote. Is "Hold On" by Kansas. Oh, that's a good one. I think it's I think it's because it's it's so suited for my range, and I get, I get to I get to do some. I never like to take the melody too far away from the original, because people want to hear it mostly the way it was originally recorded. Mm -hmm. But I get I really get to do some calisthenics on that song live, and I, I really <laughs> I really enjoy singing it. That's great. That's really off. good. Good choice. Alex. <laughs> yes, of course. Great song. Great choice. Okay. So like Danica just mentioned, we do have a game. This is a game of would you rather. There are no wrong answers. Whatever you choose as correct shall be correct. And if you want to explain why you pick something, that's great too. And if not, that's totally fine. Uh -oh. so you're going to do great. I promise. No, no one's done bad yet. We've been doing this for two years. So. <laughs> All right, Danico, why don't you take it away? And All right, right let's do this. Would you rather see a resurgence of state-named state bands starting with West Virginia or see a resurgence of state-named bands starting with South Dakota? <laughs> Which one rolls off the tongue? <laughs> South Dakota. Mm, okay. It, I think it's a good one. South Dakota, sure. Mm. Great state. Okay, cool. Never been there. <laughs> Here's the next one. Would you rather, John, produce a Mastodon cover band of kids or produce a polka cover band of Kansas? I think a polka cover band of Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> you because can't go it, wrong it, it gets me out of my comfort zone. And I, I and I like polka music. I I Koreans in there. I appreciate it mostly because of Weird Al, but I, mean, I, yes. do, I do appreciate it. So, okay, great answer. Mm -hmm. All right, Danica. All right, would you rather oh, have Brian O'Halloran play you in a biopic or have Pedro Pascal play you in a biopic? I'd have to say probably Pedro because he looks a little more Italian because I'm Italian. Okay. I, I get it. Totally. We, it's I, like, you know, you go, you go one of two really, really different directions. 
Yes. Um, I know. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're both fine looking gents, but. Like, I have no idea if Pedro can sing. We know Brian can sing, mm -hmm. but he's also a comedian. <laughs> Whereas we don't know if Pedro, ha you know, if we we just don't know if he can sing. <laughs> well, we can, we can just dub it in. There you yeah, go. yeah. I mean, yeah, like Queen. There you go. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather? <laughs> Ooh, make a super group with the Mighty Tanakh, Tenacious D, or make a super group with Malcolm Young. Tenacious D with Jack Black. I love those guys, man. I was hoping you'd pick that, <laughs> just personally. <laughs> I, I, you know, they get a they get a little crass sometimes, but I just think it's they're so funny. Oh yeah. I, I saw an episode once where they they couldn't come up with a song. They had they had they had they had uh, writing block. Did you ever see that one? Oh, gosh. So Probably. Jack Black had to go out and run with the wolves. <laughs> he loves to show his belly you know his belly's bouncing up and down and he's running in slow motion with the wolves and he finally got an idea for a song it's one of the funniest things i've ever seen oh my gosh the, and, and i, I will say know. they are some of the most underrated musician like musical talents in the history of rock yeah i, I, would, I, I think would, school of rock jack black i think he probably ad-libbed 90 percent of that movie that's i wouldn't be surprised at all He's hilarious. <laughs> and, you know, he, no, they're they're very good musicians, no doubt about it. Awesome. I do All like right. Hollow Notes. I was I was never I was never sure what uh, Oates did. <laughs> I mean, Daryl Hall, Daryl Hall, you know, fantastic singer, but I was never ever quite sure what um, is it, John Oates? Sure. I, I was never quite sure with what he did besides just kind of be on the stage with, with Daryl Hall. <laughs> Mr. Oates. I'm sure he'd <laughs> now I have to do some research. All right. Here's the next one. Would you rather perform with the first musician you ever saw live or perform with the first musician whose album you ever purchased? Ooh. Probably perform with the first musician whose album I bought. Which was? Which was? Um you know, I'm probably going to surprise you when I say this because he's not a household name. But Jeff Lynn from ELO oh. just lays me. I mean, I know ELO. Yes, I know ELO. I saw ELO um, a couple summers ago, and it's one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. Ooh, cool. I mean, very oh. underrated guy. Man, he produced those Tom Petty records, Roy Orbison, George Harrison. Uh, the guy is... is, is just so off the charts talented. That's very cool. I think it's a great answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Danica, take it home. All right. Take it, it home, Danica. Take it home. <laughs> Let's do it. Have the ability to speak every language or have the ability to play every instrument. Well, I have a lot of great samples for most instru instruments, which I know is really a sucky answer. <laughs> not very fair to somebody that really plays those instruments well. I think I'd rather have the ability to speak every language. I think that would be awesome. I think that'd be fun as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You go to any country in the world and just know their language fluently. I mean. Right. Wouldn't that be so cool? I would love it. I'm interested. Well, <laughs> if, if anyone does possess the ability, let us know. Um, <laughs> anyway, <That's> John, <laughs> this has been so wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing your time with us. Uh, before we do wrap it up, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave us with here? No, I just really enjoyed. Uh, I got to be careful what I say here. Okay. Because I know that all, there's all this stuff going on. I really enjoyed doing an interview with two females. Thank you. We love that. Thank yes. you. Yes, we don't well, often do because all I mean I'm doing two to three interviews a day, and it's all it's all men. And women come from a different perspective, like like you guys, and I've, so I've I've really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We really appreciate that. Thank and, you for. Uh, I, don't, I hope that's not sexist because I don't want to. Uh, no, no, no. It, you appreciate a different perspective, and I think that's yeah. very fair to say. And um, we we love being that. You know, we are some of the only female interviewers right now. So yes, yeah. we like being that. I got to tell you, Danica, I do some interviews, and these people they just know nothing about me. 
Uh, what was it like when you sang with Chicago? Um, sir, I never sang with Chicago. Oh, no. That happened to me years and years ago. <laughs> oh, God. I had, I had to bail this guy out, man, and he felt like such an idiot. Well, I mean, it's do a little research, friend. Like here's the thing. Here's the thing. Unless it's blatantly a joke, then you, you know, someone's yeah. like, yeah, I could do like, so John, uh, what was it like being in Chicago? You know, and then <laughs> then maybe, but no. I mean, I, I think um whether Danica and I know a guest that we have or not, we think that you need to research because we're the type of people that like going into a conversation with stuff to back it up. And obviously we also go off the cusp and, and talk about, you know, Italian food and, and hot dog mm -hmm. stands, but <laughs> you know, you have to be researched or people don't think that you're credible. So I couldn't yeah. agree more. Awesome. <laughs> I, I, I do some interviews and most of them are good, but some I do. And, and it's just, they're just kind of going through the motions. And I feel like, and then they ask me a question. There's just this long blank spot after I stop speaking, like they want me to say more. Mm -hmm. Go on. <laughs> yeah, and yes, it's. But I really enjoy doing this with you guys. Well, thank, thank you. you very much. Well, before Tell we let you go, <laughs> <laughs> but before we let you go and eat dinner once again, we want to promote your newest album, The Amazing Greats, which you can purchase at johnelefonte.com. And we also want to go over our upcoming guests that we have coming up for June, July, August. So next Tuesday we have oh. And I don't think it's on here. So Thursday, oh, yeah, we added nice. John Tesh, who uh, came up with the NBA basketball theme song, among many, many other things. He's also a radio personality. Next week, we're welcoming back Jonah Ray from Mystery Science Theater. We also have musician Jenny Tolman, musician Lucas Rossi, Clown Viss. We have the singer for Presidents of the United States of America, uh, Chris Ballew. We also have the new singer of Smash Mouth, Zach Good. We have Ming Chen, uh, Shane Told, many, many more to come. Whew. I think I got that in one breath. Nice lineup. I don't know. Nice lineup. Gosh, thank you so much. We appreciate that. And we appreciate you. And let's do this again sometime. I would thank love to. So much, John. Yay. Well, uh, until next time, everybody, have a wonderful rest of your night. And we'll see you guys real soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.